Hello, this is Lindsay Clark. I'm your primary instructor for current topics in medical laboratory sciences. And this is lecture 27, um, quality control and laboratory statistics. So the next few lectures are going to cover quality control and lab stats. Um, today we're going to focus a little more on quality control and then we will work into laboratory statistics um, coming up. The objectives for today's lecture, number one, explain the basic function of a quality control program and discuss tools used to carry out the program. Number two, define relative terms including standard control, accuracy, and precision, among others. Number three, describe the primary purpose of using control samples and identify the recommended number and levels of controls that should be run and the frequency of their use. Number four, identify two major types of quality control and compare and contrast the two. You all undoubtedly hear about quality control or QC frequently. Um, you probably also talk about it. But what is quality control really? So it is actually defined as a process designed to ensure reliable test results. And to do this, lab professionals use standards and control samples to ensure accuracy as well as reject results if errors occur. Now we all know QC applies to specimen testing, but it also applies to specimen collection. So remember your test results are only as good as your specimen, so we want a good quality specimen. And then QC also applies to sample storage, um, transport, things like that as well. I want to briefly go over some terms that are commonly used when discussing uh, quality control. So it's important to know these terms and their definitions moving forward. So standards, which are also called calibrators, are a substance that has an exact known value that can produce a solution of an exact concentration. And these are used to calibrate new instruments, um, recalibrate instruments after repair or on the manufacturer's recommended schedule. Now what does it mean to calibrate? Um, so that just means to correlate readings of an instrument with those of a standard in order to check the instrument's accuracy. And controls. Controls are materials with a known concentration that are similar in composition to the patient sample. Um, these are a lot of times produced from pooled sera. Um, and for most tests, a normal and abnormal control is run. Sometimes an additional abnormal will be run um, along with that. Accuracy is the closeness of a result to the actual value. And precision is the reproducibility or the closeness of values to each other. And we will talk about those a little bit more in the upcoming lectures. We all run QC and we do it a lot, but why? So first and foremost, we do it because CLIA requires us to. And when CLIA was revised in 1988, it included that the laboratory must establish and follow written quality control procedures for monitoring and evaluating the quality of the analytical testing process of each method to assure the accuracy and reliability of patient test results and reports. Now that's a mouthful there. Um, but basically they require labs to have a, a written procedure um, that spells out how the QC testing is done. Um, and make sure that it is monitoring all of the different methods. So CLIA also requires uh, both intra-laboratory or um, internal QC as well as external quality assessment or that's basically proficiency testing. And these requirements are in place to help ensure patient results are accurate, reliable, and timely. 
And the bottom line for why we perform QC is this. Can we accept this patient's test results with certainty? You should ask yourself this question often, and before you release results, always make sure the answer to that question is yes. Quality work in the lab is essential, not only to gain and maintain the trust of providers, but also for the patients that we serve. So if approximately 70% of medical decisions are based on laboratory data, this data must be accurate, reliable, and timely every time. And this is the best practice, and that leads to the best patient outcomes. So what if we put out poor quality work? Well, there would be some severe consequences if that happened, such as inappropriate treatment plans um, or follow-up plans, or it could cause inaction, which is just a total failure to complete a follow-up or treatment plan for patients. And poor quality lab work can also result in delayed uh, results, and that ultimately causes a delay in treatment for that patient. In addition, inadequate lab work can lead to loss of credibility of the lab, so people um, quit trusting us to put out accurate results, and it can actually um, lead to legal actions in some cases as well. So now we know some common terms and definitions, why we run QC all the time, and how essential quality work is. So just quickly, let's go over the general QC process. So QC uses control materials that have a known concentration, and these are analyzed in the same manner as patient samples, and that is to ensure reliability and stability of results um, over a period of time. And so the goal is for the control samples to produce results in the predetermined range. If that happens, then we can assume the patient results are also acceptable and therefore those can be reported. However, if the control samples yield results outside of that range, then we assume that there was some kind of error or some kind of problem and that must be investigated and fixed. And for this, patient results should not be reported because we cannot trust those results. So back to that question, can we report that with certainty? No, we can't. So individual labs um, will have to write their own QC program since all of these methods are different. And if you look at this image here, I like this um, diagram, it's kind of simple. So it tells you where you start and you run your QC is your control value acceptable? Yes, it is. So now we can test our patient and report those results. If your QC value is not acceptable, then you troubleshoot and resolve the issue, and then you run your QC again. Um, and sometimes that little cycle happens more than once. So as was just stated above, uh, labs uh, will write their own individualized QC program. So the QC plan must include all necessary procedures to ensure all lab testing is appropriately monitored. And there are several components that may be included in such procedures. So that may be a list of variables that can affect the lab results, QC testing protocols, um, proficiency testing requirements and guidelines, methods for storing and evaluating QC test results. Um, it might also include frequency for QC data evaluation, how often that data is going to be evaluated, procedures for troubleshooting QC errors and for corrective actions, routine maintenance schedules, and record retention requirements. And all of those may or may not be included um, in those programs. So there are two major types of quality control, and that's the internal QC and the external quality assessment. 
Remember, CLIA requires clinical labs to implement both of these. So let's talk about those in a little bit more detail. Internal QC is a process that monitors accuracy and precision of test results through the use of controls. So as the name suggests, these are performed internally in the lab and that allows for quick feedback, making this very useful for decisions that need to be made quickly. Now, this type of control is um, often run daily or sometimes more frequently than that and it monitors daily precision and accuracy of methodologies, uh, personnel, and instruments. On the other hand, your external quality assessment refers to required proficiency testing. And ultimately, that compares one lab's results to other labs. Proficiency testing serves to evaluate the overall internal QC program and it maintains long-term accuracy. So it's not that quick turnaround like your internal QC. And it also is going to ensure the lab is performing to those external standards. There are several different types of control materials that might be used as part of your internal QC program. So the two main types of controls are assayed controls and unassayed controls. And your un uh, your, I'm sorry, your assayed controls are commercially prepared controls um, and they are tested with several different methodologies before they are sold and then they come to you with a system specific uh, target value list or chart um, and those are used to evaluate accuracy and precision. So you should be noticing a, a pattern here. Lots of things are in place to evaluate accuracy and precision. So those must be super important, right? Yes. Unassayed controls are also commercially prepared but they are not going to come with an assigned analyte value. Um, the control values for these are actually determined by the individual lab. These controls are also used, guess what, to evaluate accuracy and precision. Now some labs will use um, homemade controls and these are usually made um, in the lab or sometimes it's called in-house. Uh, from pooled sera from patient specimens. Um, these can actually be preserved in really small quantities for daily use. And I wanted to throw calibrators in here more as just um, for your information. Uh, calibrators are not controls, but they are used as part of the QC program. Um, so calibrators contain an exact known concentration of the substance being measured and they are used to adjust an instrument or a test kit, um, a system, an analyzer. Um, it's adjusted to those calibrators and that the purpose of that is to standardize the assay. So they're, they're also important in the QC program. The control materials that we just talked about, um, they must be properly managed or it could adversely affect how um, the QC is uh, runs and the results. Um, it can adversely affect the patient results or maybe both. And controls might be shipped frozen, refrigerated, um, a lot of them come freeze dried or they're chemically preserved. So any controls that require reconstitution when they get to you, so those freeze-dried um, reagents, they must be very accurately reconstituted. If you add too much um, of your diluent, um, your QC will not work properly, or if you add too little, um, again, your QC is not going to work properly. So always make sure that you are accurately reconstituting those reagents. And for storage conditions for these reagents, um, always follow the manufacturer's recommendations for uh, whatever the proper storage condition is. 
Now, as with everything in the lab, and really everything in life, um, there are advantages to running QC and there are disadvantages. So the major advantage of QC is that the results are within acceptable range. If, so if the assay recovers the target that we're, we're shooting for, then we can take that information and consider everything else stable. Um, that includes the instrument, the reagents, uh, the sample, the operator, and so on. So QC testing uh, monitors the end product of the entire system as well, and the end product of the entire system is the patient result. And that really gives us confidence in the whole process. One disadvantage of QC involves systems that auto-verify results. So occasionally patient results will slip through before errors are caught or identified um, and corrected. So if that happens, any patient results reported since the last good QC um, went through, it, those must be retested. And they need to be retested after the problem is identified and fixed. Quality control programs all are going to have some limitations. Uh, so all instruments, analyzers, devices, and so on, they are all different. And that means that all QC programs are also going to be different. And this can make writing new QC plans or updating existing plans um, very, it takes a lot of time to do that. So that's kind of a limitation. You have to have somebody dedicate time to that. Now, newer devices sometimes will have built-in electronic controls or they will have what's referred to as onboard controls. Um, and we all know that with any technology, this has the possibility of, of to malfunction. So that can be a limitation as well. And QC plans can also be costly to implement. So this might be especially true for anyone that has laboratory developed tests. Um, these tests require QC plans and that might be expensive and very uh, time consuming. Now I'm sure that you guys have all encountered an error or two while you're running QC. So there are really two types, major types of errors that I want to talk about that can occur during testing. And that is systematic errors and random errors. Now systematic errors are those that affect every test and it's going to be a constant predictable manner. Uh, this might occur for a long period of time, or it might just be a short, limited amount of time. Now, running QC does a good job of detecting these types of errors because that error is going to happen to your controls as well as the samples, and that allows you to catch that error. Now, random errors affect uh, individual samples in a random and unpredictable manner. So this can negatively affect the reproducibility of that test. And QC does not do a great job at detecting these kinds of errors because what is what are the chances that your QC sample is going to have that same type of error um, that your random patient sample had? So if your patient sample has a clot in it, um, it's really unlikely that your QC will have a clot in it as well. And just a note here, I want you guys to remember that errors can also occur in any phase of the of testing. Um, so remember that includes the pre-analytical phase, the analytical phase, and the post-analytical phase that we talked about. And no matter what kind of error occurs, the goal is to identify and eliminate them. So we don't want those errors to happen if we can prevent them. And there are some common sources of errors. Um, they can be environmental in nature. Uh, maybe they're due to operator error, a compromised specimen integrity, 
analytical errors or measuring systems. Um, so some examples for environmental, um, maybe the temperature is not correct or the light is too intense. Some uh, reagents are light sensitive. Uh, for the specimen integrity, maybe you have a clot, um, maybe it is in the wrong tube, or maybe it has some type of interfering substance in it. For the analysis, maybe you have the incorrect calibration factor, or you have a mechanical failure. Um, and there's some other examples listed there as well. The quality control program really should make use of any tools that are available to monitor methods and ensure reliable test results. Now, no one tool is going to be perfect. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. And so it is well advised to implement multiple different tools to cover these different types of tests. And some examples of QC tools are listed here. Um, so we have periodic QC review, your proficiency testing, um, reviewing the scores, failures, any trends that you notice, um, patient results review. So you want to go back and look at your patient results. Were they all accurate? Were they all precise? Your delta checks um, are going to be a really important tool. And that, that's something that can help you catch a potential error before that result is um, sent out. Um, records of preventive measures, corrective actions, and follow-up. So you can go through and see how often did we have to do corrective actions? Uh, did we follow up on that? Did we follow through on that and fix the problem? And there are some other examples uh, listed there as well. So where do statistics come into play in all of this? Um, statistics plays a really important role in documenting, reviewing, and evaluating QC programs. So particularly standard deviation and coefficient of variation, both of which are going to be used to determine acceptable QC ranges. So we will get more into the statistics in the next two lectures and we'll be talking about how to calculate your standard deviation, um, how to find your coefficient of variation. We'll talk about normal distribution um, and determining your acceptable ranges for QC. All right, that's all for this lecture. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please reach out and get in touch with me. I am here to help you and I want all of you guys to succeed and do wonderful in this program. So don't hesitate to contact me um, if you have any questions. And here are the references for today's lecture.